and of course Ortmeier. You know, I still periodically just when I feel I, I I use as a touch point is that Sports Illustrated article that Doug Looney wrote, and I realize it was a little bit embellished, but I'm you know I could find I can always find a little nugget or a little bit of reality in that. Ort said, "I'm a teacher, a kayaker, and a rafter, a fly fisherman, and a mountain climber." not to mention being a husband, father, and grandfather. Laverne President Stephen Morgan declared about Ort, he may be a type of Socrates. One of Ort's students told the reporter, he's godlike. Another one said, all he will do is change your life entirely. Welcome to an oral history of the University of Laverne, a documentary series prepared by the students and faculty of Honors 304-351 during the university's 125th anniversary year, 2016-2017. I'm Al Clark, one of the faculty, and I created this episode focusing on Laverne's legendary coach, Roland Ort Ortmeier. It's not a biography, but rather wonders about how Ort touched the lives of so many. I remember one time I was upset, you know, one of my first years here as an athletic trainer because um, we we're supposed to be doing physicals, and normally we do them for the health center. And we were told, well, if you somebody misses it, you know, so they don't have to wait till school starts. Um, Send them to the urgent care. So I had a couple of guys miss for one reason or another. So I called up and I said, hey, we need to send a couple guys down for physicals. Like, we don't do physicals. No, I know we do physicals. We, I, we just talked with the doctor the other day. No, we don't do phys physicals. I'm sorry. I said, I've got to get these. Sorry, we don't do physicals. Mm -hmm. And they hung up on me. Like, so I was pretty irritated. So I went to Ort. And I said, I can't believe this. You know, we talked to the doctor. And they, or, you know, and, they started, and they're, they're telling me we're not going to. You know, this is stupid. And I was, you know, pretty steamed. Ort looks at me and says, were you talking with a human being? Like, well, yeah, it wasn't a machine, it was a person. And do human beings make mistakes? Okay. <laughs> you know, and then he told me, you know, we'll be okay, you know. But he wanted to make sure I understood the lesson first, that he wasn't dismissing that this happened, and it wasn't dismissing that I was trying to do right by his student-athletes. But at that point, he was more worried about the fact that if I left a bad impression, that wasn't the kind of relationship he wanted us to have. That it was like, they made a mistake. Okay, great. We'll work around it. We'll figure this out. You know, and we didn't realize that uh, being around uh, uh, Ort and Dwight and Harold Fosnott and, and Dorothy Merritt, that we were, we were learning. Ort, you know, would never cut across grass. Mm. We never cut a corner. And, and uh, so he would, when we, the guys would we'd go to the Redlands tournament one year, we were all cutting across the grass heading for the gym. The sidewalk goes this way, so Ort's out there by himself going down like yeah. that and then like that. <laughs> Ort opposed lifting weights. My perception would not be that he was necessarily opposed to that, but it needed to be, if, if you were going to lift weights and work out and that kind of thing, it needed to be recreational, his approach to almost everything. It was more about getting people involved. His um, coaching style was just so different from anything I've ever seen. And at one time I remember watching them, it's like, what are they doing? What is that that they're carrying? And they're a watermelon. They do some kind of relays with the watermelons. Then they're working hard too, but they look like they were having so much fun. But, and I think behind that too is for the ki for the athletes, for especially football, and as hot as it was, yeah. you know, you, you have to train, you have to train hard, you have to do your preseason stuff, but it doesn't have to all be grueling. And you can have fun and still get your workout at the same time. So then afterwards at the end of practice when you get to crack them open and eat them. I just saw that and I was like, oh my gosh, this is so neat. I remember one time uh, they, they asked him if the football team you know, was going to be pretty good this year. And he said that we'd have to wait and see who showed up. <laughs> uh, he didn't recruit uh, players. Uh, at least in the same sense that other schools would would recruit uh, athletes. I was talking to people, and of course I went to see Ort at the time, and talked to him about coming and playing football, and I remember Ort sitting me down after we talked about the football program and stuff like that, looking me straight in the face and saying, don't you come here for football. You come here because you want the education that this place offers. The thing that's funny about Ort tomorrow was I, I think back to when I played for him, he and Dwight, and 
and uh, just nice, nice people with always had stories, right? Wor weren't um, as intense as um, in terms of posi being position coaches is what I was used to when I played in high school. But um, we're just good guys, and so you would try to do your best. Sometimes they would say stuff that would make you laugh because you would kind of go, that doesn't even sound right. But it was just a whole different culture. I mean, it wasn't where I'd grown up. I mean, they, they, were, they were different people. What were, was his attitude towards sports and people? Well, he, he always, in football, for example, they played nine games. Three, they, they were pretty much sure of winning. Three, they were pretty much sure of losing. And three, they were toss-ups. It was three, three, and threes, pretty much. He liked to win. But I don't think winning was the most important thing. It was, it was playing the game correctly, uh, being a good sport, and uh, he, that's kind of how he did it. I to win as much as anybody else, but I think he had it in perspective. I mean, just the idea of the three to win, three to lose, three to toss up, tells you he's not trying to go 9-0 every year. Yeah. He's, trying to, he's trying to build some character, but he's doing it without going out and saying, well, I'm building character. He's just doing it, and you build character by playing teams that should beat you and playing hard and playing teams that you should beat and playing hard and playing teams that are a toss-up and playing hard and then the chips fall where they do. Yeah, he was more, I think, on building character because his overall record for the 43 years that he coached is not much, around 500%, 50-50. Mm -hmm. But he, uh, the way he dealt with people, the way he uh, uh, was so open to, to the students. He devised situations that contributed to me to be able to perform. Oh. I had a, a knee situation. Uh, knee braces weren't very beneficial or very good. So I became the, the quarterback with the rubber band knee. Oh. He devised a system that he would cut strips of uh, inner tube yeah. and would tape them on my knee and uh, make me a knee brace out of rubber. Oh. He, he did that, and I and I played with that for for several years, both basketball and base uh, basketball and football. That yeah. he would take my knee for games. And I had just started teaching, and Marty was born, and I I was able to be there until Pat had Marty. Then it came time came time to uh, for. Uh, Pat and Marty to come home from the hospital. Well, I wasn't going to be available to do that. Yeah. Orton Cornelia went down oh. and got Marty and Pat, delivered them to, to the house. Ort carried Pat up those side stairs wow. to, her, to the upstairs apartment, and Cornelia carried Marty. I was offered a job, and he said, Pat, uh, what are you going to do this summer? And I said, well, I'm going to look for a place to live. And he said, no, you're not. You're going to stay in our place, our home, while you look for a place. Oh. So we stayed the whole summer in, in his house right here in Laverne because he always went to Montana or whatever. Oh, I... and, and he would take no rent money wow. at all. <laughs> and, and, and he didn't know me. He didn't know my wife. We had a child. child could have tore up the place. The, uh, the kids in the neighborhood, the little kids in the neighborhood would come by one time and he was sweeping the, the court. He did, he did football, basketball, and he coached baseball for a while, uh, more track. When Ben Hines came in, uh, I think he kind of had given up baseball. But the kids saw him sweeping the floor in the gym, the old gym, and they said, well, you're the same custodian at football. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Orton did a lot of that. Or Corny washed the uh, uniforms. He retired and it took two people to replace him. Wow. Don Morrell and me were yeah. both hired to replace Ort. <laughs> so all the things he did, there was two of us doing the things he did. The uh, pilots during the, the Blitz in, in, in Germany uh, were doing so many uh, bombing raids that they would come back and they were trying to find a way to help them recover. Mm -hmm. And so he had read somewhere that they devised an ice pack that when they would get come back from a, a, a flight, they would go in and they would put ice over their abdomen. Mm. And they would uh, take that for a period of time. And the recovery time 
for them with that was so astounding that they were able to go back in an hour or two and, and uh, repeat it. So, so what we would do at halftime, he uh, devised an ice pack that when we would come in at halftime, when we had time, we would put this ice pack on our abdomen and, and a half. Uh, so we'd do that for 10 or 15 minutes. And it, it during a real hot uh, summer day when you were playing, uh, I mean, it wasn't summer, but during it was hot. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that that really your eye acuity, your uh, <coughs> reaction time, it, it was like you weren't fatigued at all. He came up with <coughs> different types of, of things. He invented plays and so forth, but he did special things that that uh, you just uh, people didn't know, but. It, as you, if you played for him, you, you're really amazed at, at the innovative uh, uh, mind that he had. To have opportunities to sit down, you know, with Ort and talk about stories, you know, and just so many stories through the years of, of, of just, you'd want to belly laugh, you know, of just some of the craziness <laughs> that Ort would be involved in. Uh, and want to make sure that some of those stories were passed on to students. Uh, Ortmeyer had a, a lifetime buddy uh, that he had grown up with in Montana named Greener. And Ortmeyer had uh, all kinds of Greener stories and all the things they did. Now I got to know Ortmeyer in his late, later years at Hillcrest after Corny had died and I would visit him as a pastor. And delightful, incredible. We'd have these great conversations about uh, if Paul ruined the church. I'd love to have this kind of conversation. And, and what I'm, was the answer? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> that was his answer. The days of Ortmeyer, I distinctly remember um, one year it was the buzz of the university when one of the girls wanted to, one, one of our girls wanted to join the football team. I remember um, Ort coming into Woody Hall and, you know, he would as he always would do, he would kneel down next to Marilyn and myself. We would sit, kneel down between us, and he said, "Hell is hell." He says, "I don't know what to do with this situation," but he says, "I think I'm going to let her join the team." <laughs> and I said, "And he did." Oh. And he did, and he did. But for the next semester, they they quickly changed the title from just football to men's football. Yes. My interview process was really interesting. Or Roland Ortmeyer asked some really unique questions. Like, I'm not sure we could get away with these those today. And I remember these because they were so different. One of them was, on a Monday morning, when you come to campus for teaching and or athletic training that day, he said, are we going to have to worry about how heavily you partied over the weekend? Or something to that. And, well, those were the exact <laughs> words. And I said, no, not at all. <laughs> Absolutely not. And so I thought that was funny. And then the other one was, okay, you are a young single female coming into what still seems to be more of a male-dominated athletic arena. Mm -hmm. You're going to be working with male athletes and female athletes, and um, if one of the athletes were to walk by you and you know, bump into you or you know, pinch you or something, what are you going to do about that? Mm. But I think that came about when he started doing that, uh, like... Uh, going to Utah and, and climbing the arches and so forth. He lost a, a son, mm. uh, probably, or came here in 48. And I think soon after that, his uh, son David wanted him to go swimming at Pudding Stone. And uh, Ort was kind of too busy or something. And David went and with uh, two other little boys, and I believe they all three drowned. I know all David did, all three. Wow. Wow. And, and I think Ort, then started uh, to to do these trips at Easter, invite people to hike in Arizona and, and Utah. These are the tragedy of the loss yeah. of your son. Yes. Extremely difficult time. Yes. Uh, how old was David? David the, was six. At six mm -hmm. years old. But a very special thing, if something can come worthy of, can come yes. out of tragedy, well, what happened? We decided that we would just kind of like to just get away from the dorm. And so, of course, all the guys were around. We were talking about it and everything. And so when we left, we had 23 college kids. Another reflection of Ortmeyer's. You know, they brought that activity.
and, and created that opportunity for the students to enjoy. And then that, gosh, how many years did that go on after we got out of school? Uh, probably 20 years where we'd have those floats and activities. Or uh, after uh, they had lost their son uh, in an in accident, he was drowned as a boy, they decided to do uh, Easter hikes and uh, floats and mm. so forth. And so <clears throat> after that, we would, during the Easter vacation, we would take trips and he would have 20, 30 students that we would go to Zion or Bryce for a week of hiking in the, in the wilderness. And, oh, and uh, oh. it, it was uh, a unique experience. We went to the Grand Canyon. We had outdoor experiences that uh, changed uh, your attitude and, and your, your view of, of the world. We, yeah. we uh, went to the Havasu uh, Re Indian Reservation, which is down in the Grand Canyon. And so you d saw different cultures or you, d you did different things. And so it was a very uh, broadening uh, experience. And then later on, he, he would teach a class um, it was part history and part uh, physical education when Lewis and Clark met the mountains. Mm. And so it was like two weeks of each of them. But they would follow the trail of Lewis and Clark and it became a, a class. Mm -hmm. And so for several years, a lot of the students would take, take that class. Well, alumni saw Ort doing this and talked him into having a uh, session for adults, for alumni. Mm and friends, mm -hmm. so that uh, that came about, and it's still going to this day. Regard de Parti, who was a graduate of Laverne, oh. uh, was an assistant to Ort, along with Tim Morrison, and the, the class is still going today. It's gone from tents to campers on the back of pickups to great big motorhomes. There was a course I took from Corny and Ort, the, the six-week Lewis and Clark Trail. We went out to Montana and Wyoming and we kayaked. Well, we had to learn, first we had to learn how to kayak and we had to flip over and come back up and we had to learn everything about kayaking. But then we were with Corny and Ort for six weeks and learned how to navigate all kinds of rivers. Uh -huh. Slow, fast, or it would say that you might die here. Don't die, everybody. Okay, okay. we're not, okay, we won't. <laughs> no dying today. No dying. One of the meals we, we he set us out, find a big rock, a big stone. So then he'd make a big fire, and then we'd put our stone in the fire. He'd heat our stone up, and then he had, well, Corny had bought um, some meat, real, real fatty meat. She would give us meat and potatoes and whatever, and we would cook our, our food on that stone. And we had to learn how to portage, mm. which is what Lewis and Clark had to do. So many times, you don't always have to go down a river. I mean, sometimes you need to go up a river, and how do you go up a river? And Lewis and Clark met the mountains trip you took with your sons. Or I was so amazed and impressed that he was able to put that together and to do that faithfully for so many years. And what a wonderful introduction for students into the recreation and its place in, in the environment and getting acquainted with those different parts of the West and the history and the Lewis and Clark history that went along with it. It was just the really, and good old Corny, you know, just right along there, reading her novels and, and encouraging everybody. At one point, Ortmeier, he had, it, he was so cute because um, they actually had, they were like, not matchmakers, but they just kind of helped get people together. <laughs> and so there was three girls and there was three guys and, he invited us all to his house for dinner to meet each other, and it was it was really cool. Who does that kind of stuff nowadays? Nobody. Nobody. Yeah. I mean, because they they take they take time to to know you as a person. Yeah, yeah. And I just I just loved it. I was going on this trip, this uh, float trip, uh -huh. and as a trainer oh. was with was with us. She was going on the trip, and she was a little pudgy, and so. In our, in our kayaks, you have to wear this skirt, this really tight, tight skirt. You have to put it over your head. <laughs> you know, like um, a dive suit, okay? And then it has this, 
like a lip, and then it's got an elastic, and it has to go up across this to I keep see. the water out. So I when see. you flip over, you don't the water doesn't go in your hole. I see. You, you come up, and it's, it comes off. So you have to find one that fits your, your middle. Uh -huh. And so she was a little pudgy around here. And Ord said, oh, you're a little chubby there, or something. Or like, or he didn't, I don't think he said you're fat, but he said something <laughs> that I thought, well, that, you know, it could have been heard as derogatory. The coach telling the, the trainer, you're like, you're overweight. But Ort, because you knew Ort's heart, Ort was only love. That's all he was. He could say anything, and you go, you're right. Ort could say anything, and it would be just heard with love, because that's who he was. I remember taking a class with Ort. He has such a soothing voice yeah. that sometimes it was... It would, I, w I would just get, get lulled by his voice because it was just su such a soothing voice. He never rushed you. He never yelled at you. Uh -huh. but, but, but if you could hear what he says, he's got so much wisdom in his head. He has so many things to, to tell you yeah. that, that are, you know, that you just hold on for life. We were playing Occidental here. They were pretty good. We were pretty good. Um, Tied to 35-35 at the end of regulation, so we we'll go to overtime. Uh -huh. And in, and in overtime, as long as you keep scoring, you keep going until somebody wins. Oxy had scored again to go ahead, 52-51. Um, and I remember Ort looking down at me. And I said, he, "I think he wants to know: Should we go for two? They faked the extra point, and he threw it for two point conversion. We won the game, 53-52. And Ort just had such a kick about that. And so the guys all got the ball." wrote the scores at Ort's game and gave him the ball after the end of the game. That's why that ball's in there. I don't know why we kept it so much. I think it was so typical Ort. I don't know what we're doing, giving up a football here. <laughs> that cost money. What Meyer? Well, I tremendously enjoyed playing for him. I felt that uh, for me, he was the kind of person that let me become Ben Hines. And, uh, to explain what I mean by that, uh, he gave me guidance and direction and uh, friendship and caring, but at the, at the same time, let me be myself. Gort really let me be me and let myself grow, both in personality-wise and, and emotionally and things, and uh, did not put any real limits on me or handicaps or things like that. Well, I have been very fortunate, you understand, in that my husband has let me be me and do what I want to do. Roland Ortmeier, Ort, yeah. was probably the biggest influence on my life. How so? Well, just the, the, the way he conducted himself. Um, I played four years of basketball for him. I was a manager of the football team one year, and uh, under Ort, and uh, he he would uh, stop and pick up trash, and I do that to this day. He was ahead of his time as far as picking up litter and yeah. so forth. But just his uh, his attitude towards sports and towards people uh, was uh, really uh, influential in my <laughs> life. Ort. What a guy. What a guy. You know, he's one of those unique people, both he and Corny, who invested their lives into their people beyond the classroom or the playing field. And we all, I think, just became great friends. And Tell us about Ort. What's so special about this guy? I, I don't understand. Well, I have to tell you this. He is the best thing that ever happened to this person right here. <laughs> he, he's just special. Ultimately, no conclusive reason can be given for why Ort was so special, or why Ort and Corny were so special, or why he and they touched the lives of so many Laverne students and faculty, or why he and they are remembered so fondly. But some reasons mentioned by students and colleagues in hundreds of interviews are scrolling on the screen. Teacher, coach, role model, servant, innovator, matchmaker, charmer, inventive questioner, conversationalist, generous, wise, thrifty. Response to tragedy, Utah, floats, wilderness, 
history and physical education, Lewis and Clark Trail, influence, probably the biggest influence in my life, invested their lives. I would like to thank these three colleagues for assistance in creating the documentary series An Oral History of the University of Laverne and the more than 300 interviewees who made the series possible. I'd also like to thank the University Archives for the use of these three digital resources. Finally, I'd like to thank the University Archives for the use of the following interviews. Happy 125th anniversary, University of Laverne.